Bugs swarm everywhere and attack, killing humans. The humanoid monster sits while holding a paper and utters the moon, the sun, and humanity before taking flight. Meanwhile, the people on the train are frightened as they see the bug monsters approaching. A member of Captain Jiang's team reassures them, saying there's no need to be so scared and they've been staying close to the edge of Army Camp M2, which shouldn't attract the attention of the monsters within its perimeter, and they have professional guides. And the path they are taking is very safe, so they won't walk into a group of monsters. The black-haired member gazes outside the window and comments that the black cloud has been growing larger. He wonders how much has been burned and what has happened to Army Camp M2. A civilian also looks out the window and remarks that it doesn't appear to be smoke. Instead, the bug monsters are approaching to attack their train. The bald man informs Captain Jiang Ling about the situation. She acknowledges that she has seen it and speculates on the possibility of the humanoid monster that killed the commander of Army Camp M2 being present. She, she admits uncertainty about whether she will survive, let alone manage to get everyone to Army Camp L4 safely. The humanoid monster spots her and utters, exterminates humanity. A small bug appears in front of him, he seizes him and kills him. It proclaims that humanity is locked up, and tosses the dead bug's leg into the train's wheels. The train loses its balance, causing the accident. Evelyn Clark falls outside the train, but Xiao Q grabs her and saves her from injury. Afterward, he and Captain Zhang Ling work to restore the train to its proper state. Evelyn Clark watches this and thinks that the 10,000-ton armored train was pushed over so easily. After a while, the members of her team emerge, and Captain Zhang Ling instructs them to defend the train. She then directs Evelyn Clark to repair any damaged wheels, check the train for faults, and prepare for a breakout. Evelyn Clark acknowledges her orders. Captain Zhang Ling surveys the surroundings and contemplates that, in such a situation, the lives of civilians may seem insignificant, however, they cannot afford to lose the armored train. Without it, they would be trapped on the front lines of the human monster battle, and they can only discuss the future by saving the strong first. Captain Zhang Ling wields her spear to engage the bug monsters, swiftly dispatching them. Observing her prowess, one of the soldiers remarks that she's only a sixth-rank professional. Another soldier questions whether a 6th rank professional can truly be that powerful, recalling that even the 7th rank commander in Army Camp M2 couldn't perform with such ease. The bald team member interjects, suggesting that the commander's rank will soon change. Another team member tells them to stop chattering and focus on the escaped monsters. A humanoid monster observes the assault on his bug monsters. Onlookers notice him and discuss how he had fatally wounded the commander. Captain Zhang Ling and Xiao Q spot him and rush to attack. She stabs his head, but he vanishes so swiftly that she realizes it is just an afterimage. He suddenly appears from behind, knocking her to the floor as her team members shout in alarm. The humanoid monster quickly advances toward her, but she regains her composure and wards off his attack with her spear. Meanwhile, Xiao Q intervenes, launching a forceful attack on the monster and hurling him aside. She calls out to Xiao Q who then turns to her, assuring her that he'll handle the situation while instructing her to deal with the remaining monsters. Struggling to get up, she implores him to wait, emphasizing that he mustn't risk his life. On the other side, the humanoid monster demolishes numerous trees and attempts to regain control. He observes Xiao Q and mentions that he detects a similar scent, neither human nor monster. As Xiao Q removes his mask, he asserts that he is neither a monster nor a human and undergoes a transformation, embracing his monstrous nature. He declares that he can finally unleash his true power and inquires if Blood Raven thinks the same while touching his sword. Upon transforming into a monster, an abrupt unease courses through the heart of the insect monster. The humanoid monster determines that it must launch the initial attack, and it charges towards Xiao Q, delivering a powerful punch to his face. An explosion ensues, shattering everything in its vicinity. However, Xiao Q remains steadfast, unmoved from his position. He addresses the monster, asserting that it has expended all its power, then seizing the monster's punch and declaring that's enough, now it's his turn to strike. Xiao Q engages the monsters with Blood Raven, slicing them into pieces. His status screen displays notifications revealing that the monster he's facing is a demon god named Treacherous Wisu. Blood Raven has absorbed the god's blood, initiating the second evolution of the monster blade Blood Raven, granting it a new ability. Xiao Q observes this development and acknowledges that he has grown stronger once again. 
Meanwhile, one of Captain Jiang Ling's team members reports that the sky is now clear of all insects, and the soldiers aboard the armored train have not suffered any casualties. The bald member speculates about Zio Q's whereabouts and wonders if he sacrificed himself to draw the monster away. The black-haired member reassures them by pointing out that Zio Q has returned from the woods. The bald member asks if Zio Q managed to deal with the powerful monster they were discussing earlier one that had even killed the 7th rank commander of Army Camp M2. They all gather on the train to attend to the injured individuals. Jiang Ling expresses her gratitude to Xiao Q. He asks why she's thanking him, and she clarifies that she's thanking him for saving her life. Xiao Q humbly downplays it, saying it's nothing. Jiang Ling then comments on the extraordinary speed at which his power is increasing, comparing it to the legends of Mask, who achieve levels beyond human reach in no time. In the meantime, Evelyn Clark arrives and informs Captain Jiang Ling of some troubling news. She reports that there appears to be an issue with the radio equipment, preventing them from contacting the nearest army camp, and they haven't received any reply from them. Jiang Ling is skeptical and suspects that the problem might not be related to the radio equipment. Jiang Ling demands that Evelyn Clark share the information. Evelyn explains that it seems like their signal is being blocked, making it impossible not only to send signals, but also to receive any from the outside world. Essentially, they have become isolated, like an island. Meanwhile, Zio Q checks his status screen, which indicates that the monster path to a sea of monsters is the main task, and he reviews all the details related to it. Just then, the radio equipment starts working, and they receive a communication from Army Camp L4. The bald team member notes that it's a radio message from Army Camp L4, while Evelyn Clark confirms that the radio equipment indeed had no signal the previous day. Jiang Ling tells her that she believes her and suggests responding to the message. Evelyn Clark takes the receiver and introduces their team from Army Camp N3, explaining their mission. She mentions that they are on an armored train with rescued civilians and were attacked by monsters near Army Camp M2. They receive a radio message from the radio tower at Army Camp L4. The message acknowledges that Army Camp M2 has fallen, and they are instructed to approach Army Camp L4 quickly for protection. The message is repeated by the radio tower at Army Camp L4. Jiang Ling mentions that there are slightly less than three hours left until they reach Army Camp L4, and they are running low on fuel for the armored train. However, they can replenish their fuel supply at Army Camp L4. A man wearing a cap expresses his relief, stating that he can finally enjoy a hot bath and get some well-deserved rest. The bald member reassures the civilians, telling them that they can start anew at Army Camp L4, where the defenses are much stronger than those at M2, ensuring their safety and a better quality of life. However, they receive another radio message that casts doubt on the messages from Army Camp L4, suggesting that they are coming from monsters. She questions the validity of this claim, wondering how monsters, which are not known for their intelligence, could use radio equipment and imitate human voices. Jiang Ling recalls the crocodile monsters in the shrine and the humanoid insect monsters they encountered earlier, realizing that there are indeed signs of monsters imitating humans. She takes the receiver and demands to know who the sender is and why they believe that the signals from Army Camp L4 are the work of monsters. She receives a response from the survivors, explaining that two days ago, there was an onslaught of monsters resulting in the fall of Army Camp L4. These monsters were both powerful and unusual, possessing human-like intelligence. In the battle, even three eighth-rank professionals, who are considered top heroes, perished. The survivors emphasized the monsters' intelligence, and the camps collapse, and advise not to trust anything the monsters might say. They inform that the survivors have established a temporary camp northeast of the fallen army camp, providing coordinates at E595 21 minus 262.64. They request a response from the armored train upon receipt and confirm that their camp has arranged for the handover. They conclude with a plea not to respond repeatedly. The black-haired member questions why they don't head to the temporary camp, while another member is uncertain about what course of action they should take. The yellow-haired member insists that Army Camp L4, being one of the core cities, couldn't have fallen so easily, especially considering the absence of signs indicating a large-scale wave of monsters. An individual from the group of civilians expresses doubts and questions whether the temporary camp might be deceiving them. Someone else argues that a core army camp like L4 has indeed fallen and suggests that they shouldn't readily believe such claims. Another person believes that the trap is set by the temporary camp, or whatever it's called, to deceive them. Jiang Ling turns to Xiao Q and asks for his perspective, to which he advises against going to either place, 
as both are likely traps. He reflects on the events from his previous life, remembering that the rapid downfall of the front lines in the human monster battle was due to certain monsters being enlightened by the demon god Treacherous Wisdom. These monsters gained intelligence and cunning comparable to that of humans. Under the leadership of cunning chosen gods, these monsters initiated a rampage, during which they could disguise themselves as humans, deceive humans, and even enslave them, turning them into their subordinates and causing numerous atrocities. He notes that humans, who had never before encountered monsters of such intelligence, were taken by surprise and lost significant territories. In his recollection, he also considers that Army Camp L4, as a core military installation, didn't succumb at the very beginning of the conflict. It should have held its ground until the human forces managed to counteract the monster threat. He contemplates that it seems that, in this world, the absence of his control over the demon gods in the void has allowed treacherous wisdom to conserve more energy. This surplus energy was then utilized to coordinate a massive invasion of the human monster battle front lines, resulting in a war that had not occurred in the previous world. He ponders the fact that the energy world is now moving in a direction that he cannot predict with certainty. He wonders whether this change is ultimately positive or negative, regardless of how unfavorable it might be. He questions whether it could be worse than the apocalyptic outcome witnessed in the previous world. After a while, she states that since the armored train's fuel will only last for four hours, they, feeling trapped with no good options, ultimately decide to head toward the temporary campsite. Once they reach the specified coordinates, they are greeted by a campsite built by humans. Those who come to welcome them are survivors from Camp L4 who have been coerced into serving the monsters. They are required to act as survivors to entice other teams to gather there. Afterward, as long as they bring other groups into Army Camp L4, they will be allowed to stay alive. However, before they can initiate any attacks, Zio Q has already eliminated all of them, although they rapidly clear the entire camp shortly after their arrival. The four members that Evelyn Clark brought along to exchange goods are killed by the enemy, and despite everyone feeling that this is entirely unrelated to her, she remains overwhelmed by guilt. She sits while holding a book and mentions that, according to what the people in the camp have said, Army Camp L4 also had their radio and other communication systems completely cut off at the same time. This might be why Army Camp L4 made the wrong decision and fell to the monsters. It also implies that this monster attack was organized and intelligent, setting it apart from any previous attacks experienced on the front lines of the human monster battle. It appears that the monsters have indeed gained intelligence and the ability to use strategies. Zio Q agrees, acknowledging that a portion of the monsters have become intelligent. He reflects on how, unlike other monster gods that revel in fighting and killing, the power of treacherous wisdom is not as terrifying or unimaginable as theirs. It opts to become an alternative entity that employs wisdom. Even its subordinates, the god-chosen monsters, strive to imitate humans as closely as possible. Using human methods and extinguishing humanity has always been its ultimate goal. Additionally, it is not merely cunning in its methods but also highly skilled in disguise. It does not readily reveal itself and in the previous world, he fought those monster gods to the death in the void. Yet this entity still did not disclose its true form. She inquires about his knife, commenting that it's very powerful. She asks for its name, and he responds that it's called the Flying Raven and it was a gift from a friend. She suggests that it must be a very good friend. He says he supposes so and contemplates whether she would still consider him a friend if she knew he had killed Yan Kyanlu. He recalls a memory when a short-haired girl sat holding her deceased friend, calling him a monster, and says he was her friend, and he could have potentially recovered and turned human. She wonders why he did what he did. He reflects on experiencing too many situations like this and how, no matter how much he thinks about some things, they lead to dead ends with no answers. After a while, she approaches her team member and inquires about the situation. He responds, look outside. She uses binoculars to observe the external situation, spotting numerous monsters engaging in combat with each other and wyverns flying alongside. She remarks that the direction they are heading appears to lead them toward Army Camp A1, just like her team. He asks about the number of monsters, and he estimates at least several thousand. He points to the side and instructs her to look over there. She sees multiple army vehicles heading toward the monsters and attacking them with gunfire, resulting in explosions. She suggests a strategy of dividing the vehicles into groups, luring them with artillery fire, and splitting up the monsters for one-on-one -on -one attacks. She finds this combination interesting and believes that dealing with those monsters will only be a matter of time. Just then, the train comes to a halt, and the bald member spots the vehicles approaching them. 
he expresses relief, saying, finally, someone is on their side. He disembarks from the train and informs the soldiers in the vehicles that they are from Army Camp N3. A soldier points a gun in their direction and sternly instructs them not to move. They are all taken aback by this sudden turn of events. The bald member inquires if there has been a misunderstanding, emphasizing that they are not enemies. The soldier, however, repeats his command not to move, warning of immediate execution for traitorous humans. The bald member questions how they could be considered human traitors, as they've endured numerous challenges to reach Army Camp A1. The soldier remains skeptical, that's what every traitor says, pointing out that they approached from the same direction as a group of monsters, but were not attacked. He demands to know what they truly are. He requests the opportunity to explain, assuring them that everything is a coincidence. Just then, Supreme Commander Liang Zhengai arrives and advises them not to be so anxious, as he recognizes them. After a while, in Army Camp A1, at a quarantine facility, he explains that to be honest, this quarantine facility was originally Army Camp A1's prison and a camp for redemption. It was later covertly modified and repurposed to house suspected human traders who arrived in groups from outside the camp. Many survivors who defected from the outside world to join Army Camp A1 are quarantined here, and in the eyes of Army Camp A1, these human comrades from the outside world may not all be working with the monsters, but at least a small portion could be traitors to humanity. Since there is no quick way to distinguish these traitors, all human comrades are locked up together. He has locked them in the quarantine facility. He remarks that's how it is and it must have been really difficult for her to come here, but she didn't need to worry about Army Camp N3. By the time the Sea of Monsters arrived, everyone in Army Camp N3 had already retreated to Army Camp A1, and now it's just an empty camp, however, they have set traps within the camp, sufficient for those monsters to experience some hardship. She believes, this appears to be a very serious situation. And if it weren't, the higher-ups would not voluntarily hand over those cities constructed by humans at an astronomical cost. He explains that on her journey, she also encountered individuals who had betrayed humanity by following the monster's orders, and several army camps were deceived into opening their camp gates in this manner, resulting in their capture by the monsters. Even Army Camp A1 discovered many of these traitors and given his sudden arrival from the outside world accompanied by a large number of monsters, it is only logical for them to harbor suspicions and subject them to investigation and quarantine. He kindly requests that she does not hold any grudges. She states that she won't object to such an order and if she were the one responsible for everything, she would issue a similar directive. She inquires about why some monsters have gained intelligence equal to humans this time and if it weren't for the sudden display of intelligence, the losses on the front lines of the human monster battle wouldn't have been this extensive. He explains that since monster gods are the origin of all monsters, any changes in the monsters must be connected to the monster gods and this is the extent of his knowledge, but she might have the answers to these questions. He informs her that she will be under investigation for a few days, and once Army Camp A1 has confirmed there's nothing wrong with them, they will assign them a new task and there is a severe shortage of manpower, and another person will contribute to the strength of the camp. He then departs from the scene. She inquires if she might have the answer to all of this. Turning to Zio Ku, who is studying the military map, she questions why he was so engrossed in it earlier, and what he was investigating. He replies that there's a mountain next to Army Camp A1, and there's a hot spring there, and he is contemplating whether it might be an extinct volcano. She comments that if it were a large hot spring, that could indeed be a possibility. Just then, the news broadcasts that due to an unprecedented sea of monsters on the front lines of the human monster battle, the fifth batch of supplies, specially sent by the city, has arrived by air. Congressman Song Ming, Steel, Lok, Kim Yijun, Miyamoto Daichai, and other Federation members have come to the front lines of the human monster battle, and the message to the fighters on the front lines of the human monster battle is not to be afraid, as the Federation has made ample preparations for this sudden and extensive sea of monsters. She states that the situation of the battle is very tense, however, they are so relaxed that they can present themselves, at the very least. This group of Federation members coming to the front lines is a positive development, and the weakest among them holds the eighth rank. Just then, two soldiers arrive, one of whom holds a paper stating that there are new orders from higher authorities for Army Camp M2 Jiangling and Army Camp M2 Zio Q, and the orders indicate that, because they are needed on the front lines, their quarantine and investigation have been cancelled, and both of them will be assigned to command a full squadron. He provides them with their weapons and states that, after receiving the command, they should gather at the assigned area as soon as possible 
and they will launch an attack today, and these are their weapons, please identify them. She wonders if the situation on the front lines has worsened to such an extent, and if they have placed them on the battlefield without verifying their trustworthiness. Sio Q mentions that he needs to designate someone to assist him, and that person's name is Evelyn Clark. The soldier reassures him, saying there is no problem, and that they will make the necessary arrangements for him. He then asks him to accompany him to the gathering site to identify his party. After a while, they disembark and encounter numerous other fighters on the ground. She inquires if this is their group and the redemption camp. The soldier explains that this is a final option, as all regular professionals were dispatched to the front lines long ago, leaving only the redemption camp. Furthermore, while they may not have high expectations for their combat prowess, there are at least a significant number of them, and they can command over a hundred at once. She remarks that the people in the redemption camp lack fighting ability, have zero morale, and don't follow orders. She questions the utility of having a large number of them, suggesting that it might even be more challenging to command precisely because of their quantity. He provides them with walkie-talkies and reassures them not to worry. He explains that the army camp's investigators recently succeeded in eliminating the monster's electronic disruption. Using these communicators will enable them to maintain instant and uninterrupted communication within three kilometers of each other, and they can distribute one to each group of ten. She clarified that her concern was not about the communication devices. Zio Q takes the walkie-talkie and comments, with this, it's indeed much more convenient. He agrees, stating that they will entrust this group of people to them. Furthermore, he has privileges and a map, allowing him to choose his preferred destination and this is a much better position than those groups assigned to the most dangerous areas. The situation along the northwest perimeter doesn't look favorable, as it's the area where the monsters are concentrating their attacks. He recommends that they select it. Zio Q concurs, saying they will go there. A team member questions their destination and whether they paid attention to the information they just received. They point out that the region they're heading to is extremely dangerous, with three sides already fallen to the monsters, and it seems like a virtual surrender. Zio Q responds by acknowledging that he's aware of the risks and mentions that the price for choosing this area includes the need for up to 20 military maps of the region and a specific quantity of miniature nuclear devices with tripwires. He emphasizes that they have indeed selected this region. The team member concedes, stating that they both understand, but they shouldn't later regret this choice. Zio Q promises to make the necessary requests for the items they locate, and urges the team to quickly return to the transport fleet once they've identified their targets. Jiang Ling speculates that the individuals in the redemption camp wouldn't normally follow their orders, and Zio Q plans to force them into a hopeless situation where they have no alternative but to comply. He confirms her suspicion, saying that's exactly his intention. She expresses concern over the risky plan, questioning what it would achieve even if it forced the individuals into a desperate situation where they have no choice but to fight. She emphasizes that they won't be able to withstand such a large number of monsters and will be quickly overwhelmed. Zio Q responds by stating that the outcome depends on the combined efforts of the two of them. And this is how this man ends. Well, guys, if you like this video and want a next part, comment below with the word next. Also, in the future, I'll be bringing more and more exciting videos. Please subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, hit the like button, and stay tuned until the next video.